Wimbledon, known the world over as the home of tennis. Yet Wimbledon is also home to some remarkable people who have lived through times that we can all learn from. I'm sitting where Anne-Marie Meyer attended the Wimbledon and District Synagogue from 1974 until she passed away at the spectacular age of 98. She loved this community and we in turn loved her. Can, can you hear me back that she's on the microphone? In later years, she would speak to children and adults to tell them at first hand about her history and hope that they would benefit from this. Anyway, thank you for your kind words. My name is Anne-Marie, Anne-Marie Meyer, and as you can see, I am very old. Anne-Marie Meyer. This is her story. Her parents, Selma Alfhauser and Jacob Meyer, were married in Augsburg in 1902. It was a lavish event. Jacob's family were not particularly observant Jews. Of seven siblings, he was the only one to marry a Jewish partner. Selma's family, however, were more observant. They could read Hebrew, but not understand it, and would attend the local synagogue in Cologne. They had three children, Hilda, Hermann and Irma, before moving to Nuremberg. Seven years later, in 1915, Anne-Marie Meyer was born, and Elie Sheva two years later. Jacob was a well-educated and intelligent man who adored his library and listening to early radio. He made a modest living running a brush factory. All across Germany, Jews were generally well integrated into society. The Meyer family spoke German, not Yiddish, and all their children attended a secular school. First World War, times were difficult, food became scarce, and Selma decided to become less kosher. They lifted their spirits listening to German classical music. These are the programs they collected from concerts they went to. Anne-Marie was by far the most musical and became an accomplished pianist for which she was offered a place at the prestigious Nuremberg Music Academy. Sadly, in 1927, Anne-Marie's brother Hermann died of leukaemia. Their father never recovered from the loss. Then, in 1933, Adolf Hitler came to power. They were living in Nuremberg, an impressive and beautiful medieval city. But, as the centre of Nazism, the Meyers did not realise the new dangers. For Jews like Anne-Marie, Nuremberg was arguably the worst place to be with its annual rallies to rouse Nazi zealots and hatred for the Jews. Here, the Nuremberg Laws were passed. Jewish and other decadent books were burned, and Hitler encouraged the boycott of Jewish businesses. Few customers dared to go to Jewish shops. Their father's business soon failed, and he had to work in one of his brother's shops. They took your livelihood away, they took your businesses, you weren't compensated, it was just taken. Her elder sister Hilda, who had always felt more German than Jewish, married Rudolf, a German Christian. They married at the Meyer family home, as other relatives did not approve. But since interracial marriage had been banned by the state, they were forced to divorce. Uh, my brother-in-law uh, wanted to help out financially, and even that had to be done through uh, umpteen other people, other sources, you know. If it had been found out that he was uh, giving my sister some money to exist, then I think he would have done it himself in a concentration camp. Every Shabbat, the Maya synagogue employed a friendly, non-Jewish boy to play the organ. This, too, had to stop. So in less than a week, Amory learned to play the organ and led the services in his place. Anne-Marie finished school in 1933, the final year that Jewish pupils could do so. But Anne-Marie was not allowed to take her place at the Music Academy just because she was Jewish. Since Jews were barred from public spaces like concert halls, theatres and cinemas, Anne-Marie enjoyed playing music with friends. Uh, I was uh, keen on music, so we go to ourselves together, formed a little orchestra and we entertained our friends on high days and holidays. 
and uh, that was the sort of life we had. There was nothing outdoor. The shops wouldn't serve us anymore. Anne-Marie found employment with a Jewish doctor, Dr. Leo Jacob Feuchtwanger, a pioneer of radiology. One evening, the Gestapo arrested them both. They were released the next day, but Anne-Marie was decided. She would leave Germany. Her parents and older sister disagreed. Hilda thought Nazism was just a passing phase. The real turning point, though, was November the 10th, 1938, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. The destruction of all things Jewish all across Germany, including synagogues and other buildings in Nuremberg. A neighbor of ours, who was a middle-aged man, totally blind, was chucked down three flights of stairs, and uh, of course his body was discovered at the bottom. Jacob Meyer was badly beaten up and his collarbone was broken. When they finally left, there we were. We had no doors, no windows, no beds, no food, no nothing. What were we to do? The communists, whom Anne-Marie had always politically disagreed with, came on the following nights to help repair the damage. It was a spark of humanity that Anne-Marie would never forget. Jacob could not get his collarbone treated, so Ellie Shever took him to recuperate at her Zionist youth movement farm. They stayed for six months, and during this time it was decided that the three younger sisters, Irma, Anne-Marie and Ellie Shever, would try to leave Germany. Either we had to get out if we could, or if we didn't, we perished. But of course we knew we would never see our family again, and uh, I suppose you just were aware of it and suffered in silence like so many things. Charities in England evacuated 10,000 teenagers from Europe, the kinder transport. But Anne-Marie and Irma were too old to qualify. Luckily, the Quaker Church in the UK and Germany had devised a scheme for older applicants. They found domestic service jobs, and with the Merseyside German Jewish Aid Committee, they organised these letters of application and provided sponsorship of £50 each. That's several thousand pounds in today's money. Anne-Marie acquired this identity card in Nuremberg and then went to Cologne to get these valuable travel passes. You can see the letter J denoting they were Jewish. And with this list of belongings, mainly clothes, the sisters could escape separately for England. It was a dark moment saying goodbye to her parents and older sister. Leaving and leaving your parents behind. You didn't know where you were getting to. You had a pretty good idea what would happen to them when you left them behind, that you wouldn't see them. I mean, there were so many thoughts in your mind, and at the same time you had to try and adjust to a new life. Passport stamps show how she travelled to Belgium, then over the Channel to Dover, and ended up in Southport. Highly educated and cultured, Anne-Marie was now a domestic maid providing service in a small Jewish guest house. And we were cooks, we were cleaners, we were everything. But we all took it in good spirits and spirits and we were glad we got out and that was that. She and Irma remained there from April until Britain declared war with Germany on the 3rd of September 1939. For security reasons, the British government compelled all aliens to relocate away from the coast. We had to leave within 48 hours. Now what do you do? I mean, you didn't know anybody. I was lucky because it was a small hotel where I worked. There was a young family there from Manchester. This one little, girl, little boy, two years old. My mother came back to the bedroom and found a very, very nice young lady, girl, call her what you will, uh, who was sitting on the bed sobbing. Sobbing dreadfully, bitterly, deeply. She said to Mari, don't worry about it, don't get upset. Here's the keys to our house in Manchester. You and your sister go there. We'll be back in about a week's time. 
make yourself at home and we'll sort it all out when we arrive back. They required somebody to help them in the house. They'd had a maid before that, she got married. So they asked if I would like to come back with them. Of course I was delighted. It was such a help to know where you were getting to. And I went back with them and I stayed with them for oh, about eight years. She was just Mari and that's the way life was. She was an integral part of the family. She was just with us all the time. Fate had been very kind to Anne-Marie, bringing her in to the Fiddler's home in Manchester. They made her feel part of the family and welcomed her with open arms. She was the person that was there for me. I do accept that there were probably one or two other things that she did have to do. But as far as I was concerned, Mari and I were an inseparable couple. And that was something very, very special that transcended childhood and moved right through the rest of our lives. She had the ability to make you feel as if you were what life was all about at that moment. Oh, um got used to a different language, different habits, different everything. But it wasn't the thing that we were brought up to do. But we did it, and that's all. We were glad to get out. We were glad to be in a peaceful country. We gradually learned the language. We uh, got used to different food. And uh, you just had to adjust. She never ever spoke German with us. There was a sadness that this had gone and this was behind her and all the things that might have been. But there wasn't any sort of deep-rooted hatred. Irma soon relocated to London and their younger sister Elisheva moved to a farm in Luton with her husband Yehuda and other German Zionist refugees. It was here in 1940 that they had their son Hanoch. The war raged on. None of them forgot their parents and sister still in Germany there was no news of them. It was only after the war that Anne-Marie found out that her beloved father, mother and sister had been deported to Theresienstadt concentration camp. Jacob, her father, had died there. Their mother had been gassed to death in Auschwitz two years later and they did not know about their sister Hilda's fate until a food parcel sent by their cousins in Switzerland had been returned marked to them, recipient deceased. Life in Britain was tough for everyone throughout the war years, especially for German-speaking refugees. Many ended up in internment camps, but not Anne-Marie, thanks to the Fiddler family. For Anne-Marie and everyone else, there was food rationing. This is her ration book and her leftover food stamps, suggesting she kept kosher. In May 1945, the war ended. Anne-Marie knew there was no going back. Germany was destroyed. With music as a career no longer being an option, Anne-Marie, remembering Dr. Feuchtwanger, trained as a radiologist with a grant from the League of Jewish Women. She was one of the very few ever to pay it back. She was based in the X-ray department at the Manor House Hospital in Golders Green in 1947. Anne-Marie qualified and became a radiologist at the Miller Hospital in Greenwich, then at King's College Hospital in Denmark Hill, and finally as senior radiographer at the Belgrave Hospital for Children. In 1957, she became a naturalised British citizen. Irma and Anne-Marie remained close and travelled to Europe and Israel. Their personalities were quite different. Irma was a naturally optimistic person, while Anne-Marie was more cautious and conservative. Irma always loved fashion and worked for years as a seamstress in haute couture. Like Anne-Marie, she never married. Eventually, the two sisters lived together in a small house in Hampstead Garden suburb and then in Rains Park near Wimbledon. Having joined the Wimbledon and District Reform Synagogue, Anne-Marie retired at the age of 61. For the next 20 years, she worked at an adult education centre purely voluntarily. That was Anne-Marie. She still craved intellectual challenges, so she took cello lessons and formed a string quartet. She was actually our kingpin because she was the one we relied on to keep in time and keep everybody together. 
I did know about her family having perished in the Holocaust, but uh, it was something she just mentioned. She never dwelt on the past or anything, so I always felt it was better for seeing her. She played with them most weeks until she was 90. Arthritis developed and she didn't want to let the group down, so she decided to leave. When Irma died, Ellie Shever begged her to join the family in Israel, but it was not to be. Anne-Marie remained almost to the very end fiercely independent and willing to engage with everyone, regardless of age or background. She made so many friends in Wimbledon. She regularly attended services, although she wasn't hugely religious, and in her more mischievous moments, she would criticize the liturgy out loud. She loved to attend Food for Thought, the synagogue's discussion of moral issues and current affairs. In Wimbledon, Anne-Marie had found a new community, a Jewish community that loved her. It made up for much that she had lost in Nuremberg. She eventually became more willing to speak about living life in Nazi Germany and losing her family. She would speak at synagogue and beyond, making a big impression on local children from many backgrounds. You have truly inspired me to live my life to help unfortunate people. I feel sad that you had to leave your family and life in Germany. You are my hero. You've made me feel grateful for the life I live. She was so engaged in the here and now, looking forward to things, wanted to talk about politics and what was going on in the everyday. She was a fabulous member of the community. She gave so much and brought a lot of joy to so many people. Anne-Marie died on the 17th of May, 2014, aged 98, just three months after her beloved sister, Ellie Sheva, passed away in Israel. Anne-Marie had never been bitter. Without her elder sister, without her parents, in a new country, she just got on with it. That was Anne-Marie, living and loving life, bringing happiness and humanity out of tragedy. I suppose I dare say some of you youngsters have had experiences that you shouldn't have in your age. You can only hope that you're all settling down and have happy lives after that. I miss her very much, like everyone else who knew her. And as she often used to say, that was that.